China's outbound direct investment has been increasing steadily for the past 14 years and in 2015 surpassed foreign direct investment for the first time. It now ranks second in the world for investment, next only to the United States. Largely fueled by a surge in overseas mergers and acquisitions by Chinese companies, China's outbound direct investment covers more industry sectors and business destinations than ever before. While the country continues to adjust its economic structure and open up further, Chinese firms are looking to develop and upgrade their business models to make the most of global markets and their resources. What does China's outbound direct investment mean for the world economy? What strategies should businesses adopt to become more competitive and agile? With investments growing at 20% per year, how are Chinese companies' global investments transforming industries and markets? Why and how should companies take advantage of this trend and reap the benefits from adopting a global perspective? China's pivot to world markets. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's exciting to see many old and new friends at the Caixin Debate in Davos. Throughout the years, we have discussed the transition of China's economy and its overseas investment. Last year, China's overseas direct investment is, uh, was, great, it was increasing and surpassed the investment coming into China. And this morning, the President Xi Jinping also said that over the coming years, five years, China expects to make 750 billion US dollars of outbound investment. <laughs> so there is indeed a pivot of China to the world markets. I will host this very important session, mainly in Chinese. So please pick up your translation devices. Mm. 大家晚上好, Good afternoon. Welcome to Caixin debate on China's pivot to world markets. I am editor in chief of Caixin Media, Hu Shu Li. We, we will be talking about China's overseas direct investments. And these investments are growing at 20% per year. And this morning, President Xi said China is expecting to invest $750 billion more in the next five years. How will these investments from China transform industries and markets in the world? We'll be discussing with five important guests together today. First one, Zhang Yichen, Chairman of City Capital. Nouriel Rubini, New York University. Li Xiaopeng, Li Xiaopeng, Vice Chairman and Group President of China Merchants Group. Amisha Basina Ibarra. United Nations Economic Commission, Latin American Caribbean region, Executive Secretary. Thank you. Shut up. Liu Lehong, Liu Lehong, President of China Electronic Corporation. So, let's start with one first question. Everyone replies to this question, please. So, China benefits from globalization and has contributed to global economic growth in the past years. Now, China is not only an exporting country, it also invests overseas, and this grows at, at very fast speed. So, these overseas from investment from China, how do they transform industries and markets all over the world? And this year, we are at a critical juncture of the political politics and economy of the world. Will this represent 
difficulties or opportunities to China's overseas investment. So, Mr. Liu, you start, please. Economic globalization drives is the result of productivity growth. And economic gro globalization has also driven the overall growth of the global economy. China has been starting its ref economic reform 30, more than 30 years ago and has integrated into the global economy. And China has changed a lot. Now, Chi Chinese started to invest overseas, and this has increased at a very fast pace in the past two years. In the past two years, like you just said, FDI, uh, China's overseas investment in abroad has surpassed FDI in China. And this trend will continue in the coming years. And this indeed is an opportunity for Chinese companies to better integrate themselves in the world. For example, in my industry, the electronics industry, in the past, we only export our products abroad. But now, companies in our industry started to go abroad. We started to manufacturing abroad. For example, Guanjie Technology, one of our branches who manufactured monitors, used to make in China, but now this company already set up four factories abroad. So there are manufacturing abroad and selling abroad. China Electronics Corporation has been uh, going abroad also in terms of in for IT technology. In Latin America or in Africa, we invest in important major IT projects locally. For example, in Ecuador, we help them to set up a emergency management center. This center covers major cities of Ecuador in terms of security emergency management. So it can, in the future, help Ecuador to better manage their security. And this already produced positive effect. Their security situation has greatly improved. And also last year, this system that we helped build has also helped them to manage the relief activities after the earthquake last year. President Xi also visited this center when he was in Ecuador last year. So from our perspective, we think not only traditional uh, companies from mining uh, industries are going abroad, even a company like us in the electronics industry, which is more a new industry, we are go also going out of China to invest. So this is indeed a change in recent years. Thank you very much. Che Che, I wanted to uh, quickly give you an overview of what is the relationship between China and Latin America. First of all, we had the visit of Xi Jinping. Precisely, he came to Latin America. He came to APEC, Ecuador. He came to Chile. He came to my organization. And we produced this book in Chinese, in Mandarin, and oh. in English. So it's available. But the thing is, what's happening since 2000, the trade between Latin America and China has expanded 23 times <coughs> the exchange of goods. The, in the other, on the other hand, foreign direct investment has expanded twice, from 6, 000, uh, from 6 billion, let's say, in one decade, the 90s, to almost 10 billion per year, which is not much yet. We want more. But the thing is that, unfortunately, 
the, the relationship with China has concentrated basically on five products, soybeans, copper, or so or mineral uh, hydrocarbons. So we have to expand and diversify. So this is what we discussed with Xi Jinping when he was in Latin America and the Caribbean. And he proposed a formula that is one plus three plus six, which means let's come together once because of course Latin America is far from China, come on. I mean, we are your last, your very last horizon. But now you're coming, and you're coming, I think, to this one plus three plus six, which is to base our relationship on <clears throat> trade, of course, investment, financing, and overall cooperation, of course. Six sectors, infrastructure, mm -hmm. transport, energy and natural resources, agriculture, industry, and science and technology. Now, where does we feel that Latin America has a, a huge opportunity? In agriculture. I mean, you have 1.3 billion people, right, to feed. You're transforming your economy and your consumption patterns, and you are going to the cities. The urbanization process in China is over already 50%. So your people are changing. And we can become really a very important partner on this, because China only has 6% of its land is arable. Only 6%. And you have very little water, uh, fresh water. So we believe we can build a strategic partnership in energy, in infrastructure, in agriculture, and go beyond commodities. And of course, on culture. We are, and let me just finish by saying that CELAC, the community of Latin American states, is building a very strategic relationship with China. The, they, we already had a meeting in China of the ministers of foreign affairs in February two years ago. Now, next January 2018 is going to be the second meeting. It's going to be in Chile. And this is going to be very important because China has been so pragmatic that regardless that many countries in the region, out of the 33, many of them do not have diplomatic relations with China. They have them with Taiwan. Uh, but regardless of that, the countries of the region want to be a, part, a, a trade partner and a, an, an economic partner with China. So they are really coming together to establish this relationship. Now, of course, the only way to do this is in an integrated fashion. If we really put our act together in Latin America, we can probably progress. We have had already the visit of Wen Jiabao, or Li Keqiang, and of Xi Jinping. That is the, the level of relationship that they want to establish with Latin America. Now Latin America needs to get its act together and prepare ourselves for a more, I would say, powerful relationship with China. Thank you. Diesel. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I would like to talk about uh, uh, China's ODI. Uh, recently, we found uh, good uh, uh, numbers uh, that are about uh, Chinese ODI. 50% uh, growth in 2016, 14 consecutive uh, years growth the total among the uh, number two in the world. The situation uh, showed the uh, news that uh, China's economy is good. Uh, the question is how to manage the investment uh, in abroad. In my opinion, I think uh, three points I need to mention. First, we need to share benefits uh, with local partners. We know the bigger cake we make together. More profits everybody can get. Second, we need to pay attention to localization. Recent years, our company brought here uh, many people who are 98% to the employees. <coughs> we set up a good uh, uh, training program to train the people for the uh, sustainable development. Third, we need to uh, uh, provide a good uh, plan of whole package solution. 
the meaning is we can provide a integrated business model to local partners. We call the special business model is PPC. The meaning is port, park, and city. First step, we can construct the port. At the second step, we can develop the industry park. And finally, we can build a beautiful city behind the port and the park. Generally speaking, we can provide a good uh, a special model for local partners to achieve a win-win situation. Thank you. Professor Vini. Yes, uh, I would argue that probably the economic and financial relation of China with the world have changed over time. You know, for a long period of time, China was mostly doing trading goods and services <clears throat> with the rest of the world, uh, having large and growing trade and uh, current account surpluses. Uh, most of the investment were foreign direct investment into China, and until recent years there was not as much uh, FDI done by Chinese firms abroad. And the resulting current account surplus implied an increase in the net foreign assets of China abroad, but those net foreign assets were essentially accumulation of foreign reserves by the central bank. And then when there was a creation of a sovereign wealth fund uh, investment also abroad by uh, the government institution. I think that in the last few years the change has occurred is that China has started to liberalize its attitude towards uh, foreign direct investment, has realized that Chinese firms have become large, both private and state-owned enterprises that are national champion in China, have an important role in trying to diversify in starting to acquire foreign firms, in becoming global champion and not just national champion. And therefore, there's been a proactive policy of allowing these firms to do mergers and acquisitions around the world. Uh, the first stage of it was, of course, uh, China being very interested in making sure that the supply of natural resources would come to China, investment done in uh, natural resource, oil, energy, and other sectors from uh, Asia to Africa, to Middle East, uh, to even gradually in Latin America. But now that Chinese firms, both SOEs and private, have become also important and key and strategic uh, in manufacturing industrial sectors now, that opening up uh, has also led to then foreign investments in a variety of other sectors. I would say that this uh, strategy of China is probably part of a broader economic uh, state uh, strategy. As we know, there have been now overinvestment in China, overcapacity. Uh, China has a huge amount of foreign reserves, has uh, a lot of uh, natural resources like steel and cement that are in overcapacity. And therefore, China has come out with a variety of plans. One is the Silk Road. The second one is the Belt and Road Initiative. The third one is the BRICS Bank. The fourth one is the uh, AIB, and finally, in a number of uh, regional trade agreements that has proposed to Asia and Pacific and Latin America, as well as building greater economic and financial relations. So uh, I think it's a part of not just uh, an economic uh, diversification strategy, but also building stronger economic, political, and also geopolitical relationship with Asia, with Africa, with Latin America, and many other parts of the world as well. So there's a greater uh, how to say, international economic statecraft strategy is behind the economic policy towards foreign direct investment of China. Okay, I think everybody talked about more on the macro level. I'll probably focus more on, you know, uh, our own experience. Uh, we started investing uh, overseas about uh, 12, 13 years ago, and uh, initially, we were mostly investing in manufacturing businesses in the US or in Japan, where we can help them uh, basically relocate their manufacturing capability to China as China was developing as a uh, factory for the world. Uh, so it was more, uh, the value creation is more on the cost side by lowering the cost. And that game basically changed after 2008, after the global financial crisis. 
uh, everybody else's uh, cost was going down, but China's cost was actually coming up. Uh, but China, at the same time, was developing increasingly as a, uh, a you know, consumer market. So then our investment focus started to change. We started to uh, focus on buying companies that could benefit from the uh, growth of, uh, of the, uh, the middle class uh, consumers in China. For example, uh, in Japan, we bought one of the leading tableware makers. Uh, it's called Narumi. And we introduced it into China, first into uh, the likes of uh, Cathay Pacific, uh, Dragon Airline, first class lounge, first class cabin, then five star hotels, and to the point that they set up boutique shops. And uh, at, at the same time, we also look at uh, sectors where China is doing most uh, its uh, import. For example, the biggest item China imports is actually not petroleum, it's actually semiconductor. So we last year we invested in this company called the Omnivision, which is the third largest imaging sensor uh, maker in the world. The largest being Sony, which is almost supplies uh, exclusively to Apple. The second one is Samsung, which more or less supplies to itself. And this company was trying to compete with Sony and Samsung, uh, but until the China market developed, uh, all of a sudden, you have the phone makers like uh, Huawei, like Xiaomi, like Coolpad, and so on and so forth. The company turned, uh, we helped the company to break into all these uh, uh, vendors and, and uh, uh, to, to these customers and to the point that the company over the course of one year, in 2014, uh, majority of this market was in the US, but by 2015, 80% of the market was in China. Uh, so these are the type of the investment that we see uh, that can capitalize on China's growth. Uh, so from that perspective, from a macro level, this sort of investment obviously is mutually beneficial both to China as well as to the companies that, that we invest in. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to ask uh, everybody one question I have prepared. Uh, I'd like to Alicia, ask uh, here's my all of you a question. Um, can you tell our audience how are uh, Chinese investors as a whole are perceived by the local people there? And we know that the public ut utilities investment is a bright spot in Latin America. So what's your advice to Chinese public utilities companies heading to Latin America? It's a very good question. First of all, I guess that uh, we, we have to know each other better. And I think this is a, a part of the relationship that has to come together. Um, Chinese, uh, it's differently perceived in different parts of Latin America. We cannot make a general point. For example, in Ecuador, mm -hmm. the, the Chinese investors are very much related to technological development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they are yeah. not related yeah. to extractive industries. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, in Peru, they mm -hmm. are seen as very much oriented towards extractive industries, even in Chile. And in Peru, for example, the problem is how is the dialogue with the local communities? That's another of the huge problems that, uh, that extractive industries do have. So little by little, the perception is changing. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, there was very, a lot of fear. Fear that the Chinese uh, investors were coming to, uh, to exploit our natural resources and full stop. But this has been changing over the years because we have been already in touch for more than 15 years. And these visits of Li, Jin, Li Jinping, for example, Xi Jinping, when he came to Chile, he came to a media summit. Probably you were there. This was a media summit of 100 media reporters from China and from Latin America. And the intention was precisely to change the perception of the people between the two. 
I mean, uh, we have to learn a lot about each other. So yes, there are some parts of the region that feel that China is coming with their own workers, with their own people. There's other parts of the region that are more prepared to understand that foreign direct investment is very well received, that we can be partners, that we can do things jointly. Now, the fear that we have in Latin America in general is that uh, China is substituting imports. It's becoming an import sub substitute, substitution strategy because as they are moving on to manufacturing, they are substituting many of the, of the products that were manufactured as well. So how is this going to have an impact on the, on the, on the, on the general chains? Now, let me tell you one little anecdote. The day that Xi Jinping arrived to Chile was the same day that Donald Trump announced that he was not going to sign the TPP. <laughs> <laughs> the same day. Uh -huh. So can you imagine the impact when he came, Xi Jinping came, talking about free trade, as he did this morning, yeah. very openly, we want to build a relationship, this, that, and the other. And China now is the second most important trade partner of Latin America after the US. Maybe this is going to change. Mm -hmm. Very oh. soon. Yi Chen, you have not invested in Latin America? No, you haven't yet invested in Latin America. Um, we have invested in copper mining and uh, power plants, but uh, city capital as such hasn't. So can you tell us a bit about your experiences in Latin America? Now, of course, the countries are all different, but can you tell us a bit about your experiences, maybe? Um, now, Mr. Li, now, China Merchants Group is one of the leaders of China's outward investment push. It's in particular in Western and Eastern Europe, and it's one of the seven top Chinese investors. Now, it's one of the seven top investors under the One Belt, One Road program. What's your understanding of the One Belt, One Road program? Well, this morning, President Xi Jinping reiterated Chinese support for economic globalization and went through some of the achievements in recent years of the One Belt, One Road program, something that we have some experience of. May I cite a couple of examples? Now, we were formed in 1872 as a group, starting with uh, steamships and ports. Our business has expanded since then. Um, including port and shipping projects abroad, under the One Belt, One Road program, this very old company has changed its focus. We've become more involved in ports and transport projects across the whole region, including even real estate in the areas where there are ports and other transport projects, bringing opportunities to all countries involved. Now, I mentioned the PPC just now. That started at the beginning of reform and opening up with the port of Shekou in Shenzhen 30 years ago. Um, we started with a port, then an industrial park, and then city district. That model was pioneered there. If you go to Shekou, it used to be a fishing village. It's now a part of a modern city with a population of 10 million. We're trying to take that model abroad and in many places abroad, it's brought a lot of new employment. It's helped set up a fuller industrial value chain. Now, my experience is that One Belt, One Road is not just a good medium for China's openness to countries abroad. It's also a way to share Chinese experience with the countries involved. What might One Belt, One Road and Chinese outward investment do to change the world value chain? Well, 
if we look at one belt one road, we have Chinese nuclear and high-speed rail technology, which are world leading, and they've been taken along the one belt and one road. So the Chinese belt and roads are mutually beneficial, fair and inclusive as a national strategy, and I hope to gain support of any investors present in the room for it. Thank you. I think everybody has his own or her own take of OBOR project. Thank you for sharing yours. Mr. Liu, your company was relatively late in going abroad, but now you are very active in investing abroad. So you have more overseas direct investment or M&A projects. What's the proportion? And in terms of technology, European countries and America and U.S., they don't want China to invest in sensitive technology se sector. For example, recently, Exxon project has been stopped by German government. So have you ever experienced any of the this kind of situation? Like that of extra. Thank you. Our group, when we started investing abroad, we have different measures and approaches. Now, we focus more on direct overseas investment. For example, we'll set up a branch locally. For example, I said we invest in Latin America or in Brazil, in Argentina. In these countries, we already have many factories, have set up factories, and it's been operating relatively well in Argentina and Brazil, and less in developed countries. Okay, in developed countries, we have relatively fewer investment projects, but We've been doing MMA in developed country markets. For example, a couple of years ago, we bought Philip, one of Philip's uh, branches, namely color television set uh, sector. So now in Europe, Guanjie Technology, which is a branch of China Electronic Corporation, bought this Philip uh, department in Europe. So we start to roll out not only traditional t television sets, but also smart television sets. And we are gaining market share in Europe, in Asia, and also in Africa. Africa. So our company has different approaches in our investment overseas, including direct investment or M&A. Have you ever encountered any dif difficulties? Actually, in integrated circuit, we have encountered some difficulties, especially in NMA. But for us, as a Chinese company, as a Chinese IT company, we think we have to transform, we have to enter into high-end segments and develop core technologies. So, as a Chinese company who invests abroad, such as in integrated circuit, I think people should have an open attitude towards investments from China in these areas. People should be open to cooperate with Chinese companies in these areas. You should not always say no or close your door in these areas. 
As President Xi said this morning, trade protectionism closed your door. Maybe you can avoid uh, some problems, some issues, but you also shut sunshine and clean air outside. Developed economies and developing economies should be should have an open attitude towards China's investment overseas. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us. We can agree that 2017 will be a very delicate year for U.S.-China relationship. Uh, from your previous comments, we can say that you are also very concerned about the populism. America first and anti-globalization voices of the Trump team. But on the other hand, it seems that Donald Trump welcomes anyone that claims to bring jobs to the US. Will that become an opportunity to Chinese, Chinese investors in the US? How will all this play out? Um, certainly, as you argue, this is going to be a critical year in the relations, not just economic, but also political, between the U.S. and China. Uh, there is a risk, of course, that the U.S. is going to become protectionist, that the U.S. might brand uh, China a currency manipulator like other countries, that the uh, U.S. might try to restrict uh, uh, by tariffary imports uh, uh, trade uh, from China, given a uh, traditional kind of accusation, in my view, false, that China is involved in unfair trade, in dumping its goods, in uh, uh, having its currency being undervalued, and so on and so on. So there is this dimension that creates uh, a variety of potential for trade uh, tensions. Uh, as you argue, you know, U.S. wants foreign direct investment to create jobs uh, in the United States, but even uh, the foreign direct investment relation with China is going to be complex. Uh, first of all, U.S., uh, unlike Europe, has a system for vetting uh, foreign direct investments in the U.S. Uh, to check whether there is any issue about national security and so on. And even Europe, where traditionally this has not been the case uh, in recent episodes, like in Germany and others, either concerns about national security or about uh, losing strategic assets or industries or firms to Chinese firms, that has been a concern. Secondly, a lot of the FDI that has been done by China in Europe, uh, but even in the United States, uh, two-thirds or more of it has been done by state-owned enterprises and by other government entities. And whether you like it or not, uh, that raises concerns in the US and Europe about whether uh, entities that are government-owned or are being supported, financed, subsidized by the government are having too much of a role. And the other dimension of it is a dimension of reciprocity. Uh, Chinese have done huge amount of investments in the United States and in Europe, but the amount of investments done by Europe in China or even by US have been limited. And have been limited in part because there have been a series of significant uh, restrictions. You know, uh, today, uh, right before the speech by President Xi here in Davos, the government in China has now signaled there will be some degree of opening of foreign direct investment into China, into a variety of financial services, even if it's not clear exactly what's going to be the timeline for this implementation. But as we know, uh, China has been restricted the amount of FDI in a variety of sectors that are considered as being important or strategic or otherwise, uh, including natural resources, telecom, of course, culture, media, and other aspects of manufacturing. <coughs> and the final dimension of it that is also of some concern is that, uh, uh, you know, the US, for example, in the space of uh, uh, internet and other types of companies has been open to Chinese firms and uh, Chinese champions like Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, a whole host of others have become first uh, national champion in China and now growing globally. But as we know, 
uh, Facebook has not been allowed in China, and uh, Twitter has not been allowed in China, Google has been restricted in China, and so on and so on. So there is an element of also of reciprocity if uh, US is allowing Chinese firms to operate and do business and investment in the United States or in Europe, is there a similar types of reciprocity? So I think those sets of uh, considerations are gonna imply that it's not just a question of saying we're welcoming FDI by China, in the US or in Europe because it's gonna bring jobs, but also a whole series of other issues that are gonna become sensitive. So I think a broader range of negotiation gonna to occur to make sure that the relations on the FDI side are also reciprocal and fair, and you name it. So it's a pretty complex set of issues will have to be discussed uh, on a bilateral basis as well. Yeah, very complicated actually. So the, if the, you talked about the complex package, where is the possible starting point of the complex package? Well, uh, the US has been negotiating uh, a bilateral investment treaty with China that's gonna discuss how much uh, you know, uh, investment into China is gonna be liberalized, uh, as well as investment by Chinese into the United States. Uh, that's one way of achieving an agreement or a set of rules about stuff. And of course, both sides might have some industries that are considered as being strategic or restricted or to be gradually liberalized and so on. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's one dimension of it that is gonna be important. And I think the maintaining also open trading relation is gonna be important because of course, trading goods and services is intimately associated with also trade in uh, financial assets and portfolio diversification and m and activity and foreign direct investment as well. So I think that these things will have to be discussed uh, you know, in, in a broader context of the economic relations between China on one side, US and Europe uh, as well. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Zhang, I will ask you the same question. You, your company has been doing overseas investment abroad. You are very experienced in this area. Is 2017 going to be a good year for China's overseas investment or a bad year? And your company, you are very, is very prudent in investing abroad, right? Well, firstly, I would say that in 2017, the total volume of investment will be lower than that in 2016. Um, after more than a decade of continuous growth, in particular, high growth up to 2015, so if you base it on statistics from Thomson Reuters, then it's more than 200 billion US dollars of investment. Now, that kind of fast growth has a couple of problematic elements. Now, the earliest driver was the Chinese domestic market, the need to upgrade for a lot of Chinese companies. So they tr sought high technology abroad you know, advanced manufacturing, uh, medical uh, equipment uh, manufacturers, uh, and high-end uh, consumer uh, goods. Uh, that was one part, and another part was the global uh, asset allocation uh, and what it meant for them, in particular with concerns about renminbi depreciation. However, in 2016, very obviously, a lot of this was due to the gap in valuations between capital markets in China and abroad, so trying to arbitrage between China and overseas. Now, a lot of transactions were irrational in valuation terms um, because people simply thought that they were making a buck anyway if they bought it at 20 times P abroad and came back to China where things traded at 30. Policy measures in China have aimed to bring things back to a more rational footing. So a drop in 2017 should not be seen as a bad thing. Now, you may be thinking in particular of our 
recent acquisition of a stake of 80% in McDonald's China. This is not an exit by McDonald's. McDonald's wants to expand in the Chinese market and faster, but they require a strong local partner to help them achieve that goal in China. China now is the world's second biggest economy, no longer reliant on MNCs bringing the whole set of rules that they've been working under in the U.S. or elsewhere to China is lock, stock, and barrel. And that's an issue that a lot of multinationals have faced in China earlier or later. The main competitors of McDonald's, for example, KFC, which is the second biggest worldwide, but the first in China. It has 5,000 outlets in China. McDonald's only 2,400 outlets. Why do you think that might be? Now, if you want to do well in China, you do need to have a strong local partner that understands the market and helps you to grow faster and in a more efficient manner. And it's against that backdrop that I think our McDonald's investments was a very good deal. In 2017, overall, we are taking a somewhat cautious outlook, in particular with the uncertainties brought by the U.S. transition to a new administration. So we are mostly adopting a wait-and-see attitude. So relatively prudent, right? Okay. Now, if President Xi talked about 750 billion over five years, that means 150 billion per year, whereas it's been running at more than 200 billion per year in the last couple of years. It's been growing very fast, Chinese FDI abroad. Now, before we go to the audience, uh, let me ask for brief answers from each panelist on this question. Has do you think globalization will face more challenge or less in 2017? One word, more or less, from you guys. More, for sure. <laughs> more, yeah. Middle. <laughs> more. And you, Alicia? Your question is whether 2017... 2017, globalization will face more or less challenge? It's going to be a huge challenge, especially <laughs> on jobs. <laughs> China wants to create 10 million jobs. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to create jobs. How are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, just about OK. Right, thank you for your answers to that question. And I'll now open to the floor for questions. Would anyone like to ask the panelists a question? Uh, please state your name and affiliation. question for Mr. Zhang Yichen, Professor Rubini, and uh, Mr. Li Xiaopeng. So uh, Professor Rubini mentioned uh, China basically doing statecraft. Uh, one Belt and One Road is a prime example. Uh, but a senior scholar from Chinese Academy of Social Science was telling me in the past two years, uh, Chinese FDI, 85% is in Europe or America, one belt, one road countries actually receive less. So I'm wondering, how does the profitability of projects in um, um, uh, developing countries compared to developed countries, is it a case that uh, China is doing, say, development in developing countries with one belt, one road, and doing, say, in developed countries for commercial purpose? Is this transition from a statecraft model to a more market firm oriented model more sustainable going forward? Thanks. Let me come in on this very challenging question. Let me talk about some figures first of all. We have total assets now of 7 trillion remain B. And 700 billion of that is abroad, about 10%. Of that 10%, most is in non-developed countries. So there's your answer, in our case. But some of it's in developed economies, a minority, though. Most of our investment abroad is in developing countries. That's my first point. Secondly, 
Generally, we get the sense that it's harder, the threshold is higher to invest in developed countries. They are more reluctant to receive Chinese investment, especially from state-owned Chinese enterprises, maybe even discriminatory. One of the issues in the last year has been a resurgence of protectionism. So we would like to call for parity in trade. Objectively speaking, it's been easier for us to invest in developing countries. But whether you accept that or not, our investment in developing countries has not been exploitative. It has not been straightforward single project investment. What we are trying to pilot is an integrated plan under the PPC model. Now, that's the one acronym I'd like you to remember. Start with a port, and behind that you have an industrial zone, and behind that you have a city. So what we offer you is a full package. Who wins from that? Local people. For example, in West Africa, a country I won't name, but we have gone to a city with a very old, outdated harbour. We've moved the harbour to a new location, so built them a new port, and the old port area is then urbanised. Between new and old port areas, we created an industrial zone to provide employment. So local people were very happy with the results of what we did in this West African country. PPC, in this case, it was a port on the left, city on the right, and industrial zone in the middle. So that model might be an answer to your question. Thank you. I'll give him, yeah. Um, well, you know, there is a variety of investment that China is making abroad. Uh, many of them traditionally been in emerging markets because of investment in natural resources, extractive industries, now becoming a huge manufacturing power, the biggest in the world. There is interest in investing in advanced economies to both acquire brands, acquire technology, management skills, and use it either for production in Europe and US and or for building then production also in China. Uh, I would say that, you know, uh, while you could argue that, um, you know, international statecraft has been more for investment relating to emerging markets, there is also a broader strategy of China saying we have a number of national champions. Some of them are large state-owned enterprises are becoming even larger. Some of them are national champions that are private sector firms like in uh, internet, software, telecom, and you name it, that they became very successful given the large size of the protected domestic market, and now they're going international. And from the Chinese point of view, this national champion becoming also multinational corporation globally, whether they are private or public, is part of the broader strategy of creating a wide range of economic, trading, financial, and eventually also diplomatic and political relations with many other parts of the world. So I think that uh, the Chinese uh, have a vision of how they see their role growing in the world in a way that probably United States and Europe do not have. Yixuan, you have Do you have anything to add, Mr. Zhang? I don't have anything to add. Okay, yes. I come from Abu Dhabi, from a petroleum company, and we've seen a trend in the Middle East now of look east as opposed to look west. And in particular in Abu Dhabi, some of the concessions which have matured now have been given to the Asian firms. Uh, I just wondered what China's approach is, you know, on one hand, U.S. is a little bit wavering in the Middle East region, and the shale has become such a success. So does China have a policy about expanding its presence in the Middle East region, particularly in oil and gas sector, which is really fairly strategic for China? So with whom you want to raise your question? Uh, maybe 
yourself, Mr. Zai. Thank you uh, for the question. But I, uh, I'll try, but I mean, I'll be uh, <laughs> the right uh, person to answer it, given that uh, we haven't really invested much in uh, oil and gas sector. But we do have uh, exposure in Middle East, most, mostly through uh, co-investment relationships. We, we, we manage money for the sovereign wealth funds of both Abu Dhabi, Qatar, as well as uh, uh, Kuwait. So we, we do cooperate uh, in terms of uh, not only investment in China, but also internationally. Uh, for example, uh, we co-invested into uh, uh, a city football group, uh, Manchester City, together with uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, 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 the the Roman family of uh, Abu Dhabi, and, and uh, uh, we also co-invest with Qatar uh, investment authorities, um, um, you know, many different things, including Alibaba and so on and so forth. So. Um, I, I think Middle East is a very important region for China, needless to say, given uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the need for energy. And the, the U.S., as we know, is, is getting increasingly uh, energy independent. So to China, uh, I think Middle East will be, uh, uh, will be a lot more important from that perspective. But at the same time, I, I, I'm not a diplomat, but, but, it, but I think China has always advocated uh, sort of a you know, non-interference non type of uh, policy. So I doubt very much if China is going to you know, get increasingly involved on the ground, but it will you know, build more strategic relationship with the uh, Middle East partners. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. There's been fast development of development, but more recently there have been a few headaches for globalization. Let me ask about the long term as the last question. One to two sentences each from you. In 10 to 15 years, what will the market be like and what role with will China have in it? What are your long term predictions. Mr. Zhang, 10 to 15 years, well, China will be the world's biggest economy, I think. However, I would also say that in terms of its influence, it may be a different story. The U.S. has dominated the world order since World War II. Input. But China will have more input into how the world is run. Long-term prediction. Well, we live in a world of uncertainty, so it's hard to predict. But I would say, you know, China certainly will become the largest economy in the world in terms of GDP, even if on a per capita basis, of course, will be still catching up. Um, given the rise of China and its growing role economically, trading, financial, and also political in Asia, um, the U.S. and the Obama administration had a policy of pivoting to Asia, and a key element of that was also TPP. But now the first thing that Trump is going to do when it comes to power on January 20th is going to be to repudiate TPP. And I think that gives an option to China to go not just to Asia, not just to the Pacific, and not just even to Latin America, but all the way to Mexico and tell even the Mexicans, if the U.S. doesn't want you NAFTA, please come and join our own uh, free trading agreement, our own mm -hmm. uh, agreements about foreign direct investment and economic opportunity <coughs> and infrastructure and investment. So if, um, if the U.S. is going to retreat, and that's still a big if from uh, globalization and free trade, uh, that gives an opportunity for China. We heard what President Xi said today to become a champion of uh, free trade and globalization mm -hmm. over time. Uh, uh, I would say one word, diversify. Uh, because with the accelerating of globalization, uh, every part of the world can share the benefits. That's all. Alicia. 
Well, I, I definitely think that China will be basically mostly urbanized. Uh -huh. um, climate change should be one of their uh, major objectives, uh, the energy transition, the decarbonization of its economy. Careful about inequality, very much indeed. I think it's growing. And finally, I think that China becoming a global actor should help us think and rethink capitalism, globalization, and the insatisfaction people feel about these things. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Liu, for me, I think innovation, open and inclusion will continue to drive the economic growth of the globe, of the world. So I am optimistic in long-term and mid-term economic growth of the world. And China will pay, play a very important role. We have a more, bigger and bigger share in global economy and play an important role in global economic governance. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's give them some applauses. Thank you.